Thanks to CEI for hosting this conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about green infrastructure generally, and in particular, a couple of stormwater BMPs we designed and constructed on Cape Cod to control the discharge of nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> I've given this presentation a number of times. I'd like to start out thinking about the Clean Water Act. Um, I suppose you have to be a geek like me to want to think about a statute. Uh, but if you indeed thought it was interesting to think about a statute, it is interesting to consider that uh, the very first part of the Clean Water Act, subchapter one, is entitled Research and Related Programs. Congress anticipated and intended that science would uh, provide a critical uh, point uh, for developing solutions under the Act. And I don't know whether it's possible to anticipate how far Congress thought into the future, but we're some 40 years, 45 years now since the uh, implementation of the original act, the Federal Clean Water, uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act, and then the 1977 amendments, which uh, we now refer to as the Clean Water Act. And, and yet here we are, 40 to 45 years later, thinking about uh, taking a, a fresh look, a basic and applied research look at this thing that we call green infrastructure. You know, green infrastructure is a bit of a paradigm shift for us if we are traditional uh, gray infrastructure civil engineers because it, it's a lot of soils engineering, soils mechanics, soils management, and there's a lot of microbiology involved. And indeed, this, this BMP is no exception. Um, now, we're going to, the nice thing about this presentation, it's got a lot of photos in it. Uh, I want to try, if possible, to hit the highlights. There's a lot going on here in terms of cost, efficiency, siting, and uh, perhaps some of those nuances will, will flush out in the Q&A. So everything needs a catalyst, and of course, the catalyst here uh, was, was this impending permit. We've been thinking about green infrastructure and taking a look at some of these technologies for quite a while now. In fact, we've done work with porous asphalt BMPs. We've done work with, um, uh, we, did, we developed an infiltration BMP for phosphorus in Providence, you know, in part because uh, we're trying to develop the solutions. We don't want you to have to do this. We want to be able to make it as easy as possible, believe it or not. Uh, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of different forces, but essentially what we're really trying to do is execute the law, which we're, we're supposed to do because we're an executive agency, and provide solutions and make things as simple as possible for you guys to implement in order to address some of these problems. So it, there's, there's a number of things going on here. One of the nice things to, to just to refer to is, is a policy now where, where a certain percentage of SRF SRF financing is available for green infrastructure projects. You know, you, you go through the whole optimization process at some point, and what's going to happen is you're going to say, you know, this is really the best spot for a green infrastructure project um, if we're going to do a infra green infrastructure project. You know, perhaps we could use, we could leverage this funding for this. So that's something to consider. And then, of course, the, the, the Cape Cod, the, uh, the, the Water quality plan update uh, was a major driving force in, in developing nitrogen BMPs on Cape Cod. Um, we were asked, uh, basically, uh, there's got the Southern New England program is a new program, and it's uh, one of the champions is a, is a congressman uh, from Rhode Island, Congressman Reed. Um, you know, Cape Cod understands that their environment is, is critical to their economic future. Uh, which is one reason why they've been very proactive. They've done an excellent job. Uh, all the people on the Cape have done an excellent job. And they asked us, basically, you know, if we're going to do and spend some grant money that we have available through the SNEP program, could we please de uh, develop something for stormwater? They felt that even though wastewater is, is the larger portion of the nutrient problem, that the new permit and the stormwater uh, arena was, was somewhat uncertain, and they wanted us to take a look at uh, stormwater BMPs, and in particular for nitrogen, which we hadn't done. Nitrogen is somewhat difficult. 
even though at the end of this presentation, you'll see that this BMP is actually extremely simple. To hold, the whole hydraulic basis for its control is a simple orifice at, at, at the outlet. Uh, porous asphalt, for instance, in, in comparison, as simple as it sounds, is actually much more complicated. So these BMPs can be extremely effective, they can be cost effective, and they're not that difficult in terms of, of thinking about how they work. We have a lot of interest in green infrastructure. We want to demonstrate how, how innovative they are, particularly the innovative technologies like this one. This is a subsurface gravel wetland. It's a prototype that we took. Basically, we, we took a prototype, a very small prototype, developed by UN, the uh, UNA Stormwater Center and applied it here on a real scale to see uh, if we could do it. If we can do it, you can do it. Uh, technology transfer, that's exactly what I just said. And then building uh, understanding and acceptance for green infrastructure, which again is a bit of a paradigm shift if, you, if, if we really have always thought about civil engineering in terms of gray infrastructure. So the, the state, the Cape Cod Commission and the, and the municipalities basically came to us and said, look, if you're gonna do something, would you please do something for stormwater? And what we did is says, okay, well we invited all the municipalities to submit proposals. Uh, to us, and we, uh, we I received maybe eight to ten proposals, and EPA took a look at that, went down to visit every single site, took a look at all the critical data, and made a preliminary determination that we were going to focus on a couple of sites. Uh, we didn't want to, to spend uh, a lot of time and energy going through a selection process if we could do that ourselves. So. One of the, 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 a lot of the selection criteria that went into our decision to choose these sites had to do with the ability to partnership, transferability of the technology, the ease of permitting. Uh, I actually, uh, we did all the permitting work up front. I, I talked to Fred Sivian, who was a, a wonderful source for understanding how we would be in compliance with the stormwater standards. It wasn't as easy as I had thought. Fred was able to point out certain nuances that made a big difference. So. We, we figured that if we're going to do a project like this, we're EPA, we should nail every single permit requirement. Uh, we don't want to miss one of those. Um, so this, this, we we're also looking for sites that were located so that the public could get a real good impression of, of the work that we're doing. Uh, we wanted to, to, to really have an impact on the nitrogen load, so we wanted to, to focus on an area where a discharge was occurring to an impaired water body. And then there's other, obviously, logistical uh, construction related uh, criteria, uh, materials management, et cetera. Uh, so this first site we, we decided on is a site, thanks to Dale Saad and Roger Parsons uh, in the town of Barnstable, they teed up what is perhaps the quintessential site for this project, a very, very small, small parcel. And turns, it turned out that the actual area of the parcel was smaller than we were uh, than, than the one we got because we can only use a portion of that. The nice thing about this is it was right in the center of a town where the public walks by every single day to go to um, to go to the the, the, um, the ferry, the ferry to go over to uh, Hyannis, and uh, uh, and, um, and and it was right located. Basically, the nice thing about this, if you're going to do one of these projects, of course. It's a, it was really nice to be able to tie in and intercept the MS4 and thereby disconnect all the IC for that subcatchment and, and, and tie that, intersect the MS4 and discharge it into the BMP just before it discharges to the water body. So this was a perfect site for us. If we could do it here, we could do it anywhere. It was complicated as we'll show, but uh, it's a great, great site. The next one, thanks to Bob Duncanson, uh, was a site in Chatham uh, this was a little off the beaten path, but it was a really wonderful opportunity to grab a significant amount of load uh, in an area that uh, we could, we could it was all invasive growth, so it was easy. We didn't have to deal with a whole lot of permitting questions and issues. So it was pretty much straightforward in and build this thing and, and manage a lot of load. Thanks, Ray. So he's, he went over um, a lot of the background, how the project got to where it was. I'm going to go a little bit into the design and then construction, and then Ray's going to talk about there's um, there's going to be an extensive monitoring program uh, for, of these BMPs. 
So as Ray pointed out, um, we had some site constraints to work with. The Barnstable site um, was a, a relatively small park site, uh, formerly a residential property that the town acquired. Uh, it had the advantages of having a, a high traffic, but that was also a disadvantage from a construction standpoint. Um, the, the parking, uh, some of the parking for the ferry and the actual ferry entrance, this was in between, so we got a lot of had to reroute a lot of traffic during construction. Uh, and in Chatham, uh, it was, we had a very big site to work with, but uh, largely wetlands, so we only had about 0.3 acres available uh, to work with. And the challenge there was, this is the street that goes down to the pond. Um, it's a high point in topography and a low point in the drainage system. So the drain line's down about 15 feet that we wanted to intercept and get over into this BMP. Uh, this is a basic picture uh, schematic of the BMP. Um, there's two um, major components. The upper portion, you can see where the inlet comes in. This is from the diversion from the MS4 system. This upper portion is uh, vegetated a little differently at each site, but it's a vegetated um, surface storage. And then the underlying uh, treatment portion is a lined stone uh, bed uh, underneath that, that area. And the, this is an infiltration zone, which basically we capture the stormwater, we divert what we want to treat, capture that stormwater and infiltrates through this zone and the small orifice Ray was talking about is located at the top at the end of the stone bed. So to go through how this works, um, this is that same schematic and at the beginning of a storm, uh, after a couple days it hasn't rained, you'll have water in the bottom bed but that upper surface area is dry. As the storm starts, that infiltration zone starts to work and that water has pushed, starts to push through that orifice, the treated water out of that under, underlying stone bed. And as the storm builds, the surface, the surface storage actually starts to build, holds that water, but you're still getting that, uh, that hydraulic pressure to push the water through the system. Uh, at the end here, in larger storms, there are some overflows. Um, we weren't too concerned at that point because we've captured our water quality volume. Those overflows are tied back into the outlet system and go back into the MS4. And then following the storm, it goes back to that pre-storm level. Uh, a little bit, I, we wanted to get into the construction. This is the Barnstable site. If any of you are familiar with it, this is the, um, uh, the marinas here and this is the Maritime Museum right in downtown. Uh, this is the MS4. You can see two, three foot clay pipes 24 inch diameter. Uh, we exposed it because we're going to cut into that and divert um, that flow into our BMP using a diversion structure inside a new um, vault. This is, um, you can see he had the, he, it was a pretty tight site. Um, we took extra precaution to protect the park. This is the sidewalk that winds from the parking area and the museum over to the ferry and, the, and other parts of town. Uh, he had to use pretty small equipment because the site was pretty tight. Um, we didn't want him making too much noise because it's right in a fairly residential area. Material handling was a challenge. We had to truck things in and out uh, as we needed them. Construction uh, was mainly from an access road beside it. This is the excavation for that bed. Uh, and he, built a, he had to cut out a platform out of the slope there to work from. And you can see in this picture, this is the diversion structure, which is over that clay MS4 you saw in the previous pictures. And then this is the bottom liner. And this structure here is actually the outlet. So water will come in, enter that upper garden area, infiltrate at the end of the garden through our infiltration zone into that stone bed. And then that small orifice is located in a, a structure there. We've also installed a couple extra structures to accommodate sampling equipment, which Ray will get into a little later. This is a stone going in. Um, we had to use a, it, 
we didn't want dump trucks going right to the edge and dumping in, into, the, um, into, the, into the bed and compromising the edge of our liner or the edge of that excavation. So we used a, a mixer and just dry stone. That's typical, that's just three quarter inch wash stone was our, um, our, our stone material. And you can see that just that construction progressing in that other photo on the right. That's the finished Barnstable site, uh, looking the same direction as that initial photo. Uh, this is, uh, this was a design planting. Cape Cod Commission uh, donated some of their landscape architects uh, uh, to design uh, plantings for this because it was so visible. Um, and there's going to be a placard there as well, which explains what it's doing uh, to get that outreach component. And that's actually it during a storm. You can see the, the water builds up, and eventually that'll go down. Um, that, that bed will not dry out, but it gets moist. It stays moist. Um, and then um, the storms... Uh, just repeat themselves and go in and out. This is one of the uh, access manoring manholes for the monitoring equipment. Uh, it's gonna have automated monitoring equipment in it. It's got a flume for measuring flow and velocity. Then Chatham was a little bit, the site was a little bit different. That is a picture of the site before we started anything. And that's their attempts at site clearing. So there's quite a bit of work up front. And uh, as Ray pointed out, there were a lot of invasives in there, so no one was too um, brokenhearted about clearing this site. That's the site uh, clearing proceeding, and uh, fortunately enough, the soils were good enough that because we were so deep with that MS4 system we were diverting from, we could excavate deep enough on this site uh, um, and still be able to do construction and get the water in, so it made the site feasible. And that, just like Bar uh, in Barnstable, this is the bed going in. That is the cavern we had to excavate to install the diversion structure. Uh, that was, um, that basically closed the road down. So, this is the top liner going in. Uh, you had to, we had, um, we had him put down, um, he worked off uh, plywood so that he wouldn't damage that liner. Uh, this just behind him is uh, formed out so that that's where the infiltration zone is going to be. We used uh, an enhanced sand mixture uh, uh, planting with planting materials so that that infiltration zone would be make sure to get in. And then the picture on the right is him installing the, um, we call it biosoil, it's basically a loam rich, uh, loam and compost and sand rich mix. Uh, again, these multiple manholes for the monitoring. This is looking from the other end uh, with some outlet, outlet protection for the water that's been diverted from the MS4. And then this picture on the right is the uh, picture of the access gate, and you can just see the finished basin down in, in, in behind it. And that's the finished site. So Ray's going to talk a little bit about, um, fortunately, uh, EPA is generous enough to be sponsoring some assessment of these BMPs. Ray's going to talk a little bit about um, how that works. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I just want to pick up uh, and, and pretty much uh, try to convey how we think these things are going to operate. I'd also like to see if I can pick up a couple of points uh, and go back and, just, and help describe exactly how this thing works. But uh, yeah, I mean, this is a retrofit. Retrofits are tough. They usually cost a little more on a unit cost basis. But um, as, you, as you'll see, uh, this system was designed for only 0.3 inches. Both systems were designed for capturing only 0.3 inches of stormwater runoff, 0.3 inches of water quality volume. You can do that with a retrofit. You're not constrained by the one inch water quality volume requirement in the mass standards. You know, uh, because this was less than, uh, you know, an acre or two, and it was a retrofit. So you, you design and manage to a maximum extent practical, maximum extent feasible standard, okay? Part of the work that we're doing, you saw all those structure arrays that we put in there, too. That's the basic and applied research aspects of this project, which increases the, increased the cost of the project for us. 
But the, what we're trying to do is develop these performance curves so that if you want to do one of these, these BMPs, all you really have to do is, is know where you want to site it, and then, well, this is what the pollutant we want to control. This is how much water volume we can control. And you say, so, okay, for a 0.3-inch storm, I, I, if I can manage this 0.5, 0.3-inch storm, look, I'm going to get 42 to 51% of the nitrogen load. So you get a disproportionate amount of nitrogen by capturing these small storms. And remember, storm water, it, it, when, it, when, it, when a storm occurs, of course, it takes the temperature, which is also a pollutant, it takes the nutrients, and it's a very quick discharge to, uh, to the water body, a very first, first flush. By capturing these very small storms, we're, we're basically taking out a tremendous amount of load. But we think, we think that the performance is going to be even better than that. These two charts, charts uh, show some data that was recently connect, uh, collected by the UNA Stormwater Center. On the left, what you're seeing is a, is a fairly large storm, a two-inch storm that occurred over a short period of time. In no time at all, all of the nitrogen washed, washed off, almost, almost at the very beginning of the storm. Boom, all the nitrogen's off. And then here's a, a slightly smaller storm, but even in that case, you're basically, you're basically washing off within a very short period of time. So we expect that these BMPs will, will operate even better than, than we, we anticipate. But that's why we're going to go through this monitoring process, which is, is quite significant. Just the monitoring equipment alone is a, is a, bit, a bit of a research project. So the other thing I wanted to talk, talk about very quickly is just that on the front end of this, of this where is it? There you go. Basically, on the front end of this thing, you have an oxidation process. You're converting all the nitrogen to, to nitrate. And you're carrying those electrons down into the subsurface, which is anoxic. And that's where you, you go into your denitrification stage. The electrons are used by the microbes to convert nitrate into N2. It's very complicated, but it's also that simple. And, and we expect that these will work. It takes a little time for those bugs to, uh, to populate, which is why we've taken a little time to wait before we start monitoring. But again, we're going to start monitoring, collect nitrogen. Very simple data, though, of nitrogen flow. And then again, uh, just, to, just, to, just to clarify this point here, is that um, the orifice is designed to achieve the re required retention time for complete denitrification, which in this case is about 24 hours to 33 hours. So even though flow, this, is, this thing is going down over time, the flow rate out gives you the time to denitrify. And then whatever's left in there, of course, is just sitting there denitrifying until the next storm. 